All right, a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, welcome and thank you for being here tonight or this evening for our monthly series, Librarians Wall. A monthly session where our librarians share their experience, give their insights and thoughts on the area of their expertise. So in 2014, the National Library became a member of the Biodiversity Heritage Library, the world's largest open access digital library for biodiversity literature and archives. Our librarian, Lim Tin Seng, will share interesting titles in the collection which covers topics from the natural history of Singapore to the institutional records of the Singapore Botanic Gardens. Uh, our librarian, Lim Tin Seng, is, a, with, is with the National Library and his research interest lies in urban planning and the interactions between the environment and urban growth. Also, if you'd like to see one of his projects, you can actually go down to the plaza and uh, take a look at the lobby and take a look at the curiosity project that uh, he, let, he, lets, he leads uh, one of his projects. Also, his article on the greening history of Singapore was recently published in the Journal of the Malaysian Branch of the Royal Asiatic Society, Jambras. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lim Tin Singh. Okay, thanks for coming down. All right. Um, if you look at my title, I think it's naturally to state that I will be talking about two, two things. I'll be talking about the Singapore collection as well as the Biocity, Biodiversity Heritage Library or BHL for short. All right? But I'll start off with BHL because I think we have, I have to tell you what is it, right? what is it all about. Now, simply put, okay, BHL is an open access digital library for biodiversity literature and archives. Okay, it was created in 2006 by a group of uh, UK and American uh, natural history libraries and botanic gardens, including the Smith Smithsonian Libraries, which is actually managing the BHL today, as well as the American Natural History Museum in New York, the uh, Royal Botanic Gardens, and the Natural History Museum in London. All right? So why did they create such a thing, right? Well. I think the reason is because uh, they want to provide users easy access to the world's uh, biodiversity literature and archives. So in fact, having such a service is uh, something that uh, many natural historians, horticulturists, botanists, or whatnot, always wanted, all right? In fact, you know, our dear friend Charles Darwin and his peers actually wrote in 1847 to the British Muse Museum stating that, well, basically he's saying that well, we need a good library, or else I cannot come up with a good research, right? So, hence, BHL was created. Okay, but one thing before I, be, before I move on, I, I want to share that uh, what you can find, okay? Why is it so important to have a good set of, good collection of biodiversity uh, uh, works, right? That's because we can use it to find all sorts of information that's critical to the studying of life on Earth, all right? So, this includes... Um, uh, species descriptions, uh, distribution records, which can which we can use to uh, examine past population distribution and determine its changes over time. Uh, historic clim climate records. I think right now what we're going through, I think it's pretty important, right? You can chart the differences and all these things, and chart and understand the changes that we're going through uh, in terms of our, our climate out there. And also we can um, look through the records of our history discovery. Um, a scientific discovery. So that would include like ex expeditions that document modern sciences, uh, first encounters with various religions, cultures, ecosystems, and things like that. All right? And also, of course, we can find records of extinct species. All right? Also, uh, scientific observations and scientific illustrations. Okay, this one, this one everybody knows, right? If, if you are interested in this type of materials. Scientific illustrations of plants and animals, which are always very valuable and beautiful in this, this kind of collection. All right? And also, we can, f we can use it for, uh, to trace uh, our ecosystems. All right? So uh, it's like we can identify the various components in different ecosystems and assess how they have changed over time. All right? So it's very, very rich. But uh, well, before BHR, right? Historical, historically speaking, uh, most of the, this literature uh, has only been available in the better developed countries, right? So, so hence, in fact, they have a term 
that describe this uh, this uh, disadvantage, right? This dilemma, all right? And we call it tax taxonomic impediment, all right? Because uh, without good set of resources, you cannot come up with a good research. Basically, that's what it means. Well, fortunately for BHL, you know, things have changed, all right? So we have a good ex a good collection, and we can access them anytime, okay? Because it's open and it's free, okay? Now, how did they do it? Okay, I think it's, uh, we, okay, you have to understand that BHL operates as a consortium of natural history uh, and botanical, bot botanical institutions and libraries around the world. Okay, so it's not that they, it's their, that this library has all the books. No, he, have, he has this consortium and this consortium actually worked together to develop the library. So what they did is they digitized their own set of natural history collection and then make them freely available online by uploading what they have digitized onto the BHL website, all right? And then uh, we have a lot of members, I mean, BHL has a lot of members, okay? Uh, as of uh, 20, September 2019, there are 20 members, 22 affiliate members, and over 80 partners. So what are the difference? What, was the, what are the difference between these members and affiliates? Usually it's the privileges that they have, okay? In terms of governance, in terms of membership, and things like that. All right, so you can see this is a list of members, and we are there. National Library Board, the, the highlighted uh, font. Yeah, and if you're interested, these are affiliate members in BHL. So to date, BHL has uh, roughly about 57 million pages, okay, which comprises, uh, which comprise over 150 million, oh, sorry, 150,000 titles and 247 volumes of books, okay. But you must know one thing that BHL is not just uh, giving access to these books, okay? It also provides taxonomy name recognition, okay? This is a very important component when it comes to this kind of natural history research. So using the global names recognition and discovery uh, tools powered by uh, global names architecture, BHL and Index have stated up there 191 instances of taxonomic names throughout its collection. All right. So in addition, uh, he has also worked with uh, rights holders to secure uh, permission to digitize in copyright content in BHL. Now to date, he has uh, received permission uh, for over 795 in copyright titles, and that amounts to agreement to uh, over 315 licenses. Right. Okay, more statistics. All right. So since the launch of uh, BHL, uh, over 9 million unique users have uh, visited library and on average it receives roughly about 125,000 unique visitors each month. And for visits, uh, BHL has recorded over 17 million visits and averaging uh, roughly about 215,000 visits each month. Okay, so where do they come from? All over the world, you can see down there. Okay. Now, uh, BHL is so uh, to, to expand their, their reach, they are very active in the, in the social media circle, all right? And uh, if you want to follow them on these different channels, you can use their handle at BioDive Library, okay? It's written up there, take a picture, and you can go and explore. But one of the social media uh, uh, channels that I want to highlight is the Flickr social media channels, all right? Because it is BHL's most popular social media site, okay? It has 145, well, over 145,000 images, and they are very stunning, okay? They are all scientific illustrations taken from the collection. Now, it has a, uh, well, you we can see the total number of views, 514 million plus, five, more than 514 million views. So you can see that how popular it is. So what BHL did is, is take advantage of this, uh, uh, the, the popularity of their Flickr, Flickr, Flickr page, and they actually asked his community to add tags. So by, uh, so far, they have, uh, all these uh, volunteers have uh, tagged roughly about 41,000 images in there. So that's about, what, 30% of it? So if you want to use this, okay, I will encourage you to go take a look. You know, just uh, Google BHL Flickr, you can see all these uh, scientific illustrations of birds, animals, and all this. You can use it for anything that you want because they are copyright free, put, put it that way. Maybe you, should, you have to cite it from where, huh? Flickr or something. Okay, and uh, oh, by the way, it's like in 2015 in Wired Magazine, it say that it's one of the, uh, one of the must follow uh, Flickr site. 
in the world of science, something like that. All right. Now, also, as I mentioned briefly, uh, BHL uh, is not just providing access to biodiversity materials. They also have tools and services. All right. And these mostly are to locate, help users to locate and keep the content that they find in BHL. So uh, I, I, I mentioned briefly, one of them is uh, using taxonomy name searching. All right. And then uh, the other one, the other ones are stated here. One thing is that uh, BHL's uh, bibliographic data can be freely accessed and downloaded uh, using different API tools. All right. API tools, you guys are quite familiar with this, right? And data exports uh, tools. So users can also uh, freely download all the content in there in PDFs and keep it. All right. And he has also worked with uh, Crossref to assign DOIs. Okay. There's uh, something like a permanent link or something, okay? so that you can cite it. And to date, he has assigned roughly about 136,000 DOIs. Yep. And also, there are all kinds of reference um, management tools, such as uh, bibliographic downloads in uh, bib tags and RIS formats. So you want to build a library on these things? can actually use their bibliographic data. Okay, so how does it look like, right? So you, you go to the website, which I show in the first, bit, first slide. You do a search, you find a book, and this is how it looks like. Okay, you enter the book. This is their uh, book viewer. So you can see uh, on my right side, there's this uh, search inside this book. Okay, so over here is where you can uh, search the text of it. Text in the books, okay? So you, after that, uh, you want to download the book, you can go up and there's all kinds of options up there. You can, um, what it says, you can view the met met metadata, you can download the book as PDF and save it and keep it. And if you want to share it, you can use the so so social media tools up there as well, at, at the header. And then finally on the lower left, you will see the taxonomy name recognition function, all right? Now this one, this. What it does is that it, 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 it kind of recon recognizes all the scientific names that you can find in maybe this page. And then if you click on it, it shows a list of uh, books that has this uh, scientific name. Okay? Like I show you uh, over here, it's like one of the books is this, and then there are others. So you want to search this, this taxonomy name search. So maybe on some species and want to see where it occur throughout the BHL uh, collection, you can find it, you can trace it back, you can s try your best and trace it back to see how, as far as possible to see when did it first occur. All right. So maybe you want to do a history or something. That's a one way to do it. Okay, so, so what are the titles you can find? I draw, I drew up uh, three titles. Okay, there are how many? There are a lot, right? So what about I find these three very, very interesting. Okay, it's the first one is Charles Laius, uh, Principles of Ge Geology. I think if you're a geography student, you should know, right? This book uh, is talks about um, that it kind of says that geological, our Earth's uh, geological formation, movements, it's not caused by one-time event like the Great Flood or things like that. Rather, it took place over a long period of time. It's a quite a important book, okay, if I'm into these things. And this is not just an ordinary copy, all right? It's from the Charles Darwin Library, which is part of the BHL. In fact, the, uh, BHL has, um, has the library, all right? Uh, the library has about 1,500 books, but BHL has already digitized 300, 300 of them. And these 300 books they have digitized are heavily annotated by Charles Darwin. So for this copy, this is the volume two of uh, Charles Lyers' book, all right? Okay, in, in, in this little passage, at the side of it, he wrote, if this were true, adios theory. So what theory, right? Theory of evolution. Why? Because this, this little passage, of course, of course I, I mentioned that Charles Elias say that uh, geological formation takes place along, uh, over a long period of time, but he did not apply this uh, concept, this theory, to organic matters, okay? Animals. Why? Because he said that, okay, for animals it's different, because they are centers of uh, creations in different parts of the, uh, of the world. And then for animal or anything, it, uh, what it, what it, it was designed for the habitat in that region and will become extinct when the, when the habitat change. Okay, so when I would say that Charles Darwin saw it, it's like, whoa, 
If this were true, then that's it. Lah. That is for evolution. So from this one little annotation, as well as the, all the Charles Darwin library that has been teach, uh, books that you can find, what you can sense is that uh, you can use the, this uh, BHL uh, collection and, and the Charles Darwin library, of course, in there to, to understand how he, how he thinks. Of course, he did not come up with a theory of evolution by just going to Gala, Galapagos Islands, right? Instead, he studied a lot of theories of others, counter, countering it, arguing it, arguing against it, and came up with his own theory. So you want to go in depth, you can use. This is just, a, just an example. All right, the second one, this is the oldest book in, uh, in the BHL uh, library. It's by Peter, sorry, my German, right? Peter Schofer, okay? Schofer, you should know him. Peter Schofer and Johannes Fass. They are the ones who actually took over Johannes Gutenberg's printing press, okay? Because Johann Faraz, he was a money lender, so he lent uh, all the money to Johannes uh, Gutenberg to build out his printing press. And when the time comes, he said, "Sorry, I I need to foreclosure your stuff," and he took over. All right. Anyway, this is the oldest book, and what it contains is uh, roughly about 150 plants and 96 medicine that's formerly. Uh, that's uh, commonly found in, oh wait, it's published in 1484, uh, is that, that was commonly found in apothecaries, all right? And each plant description is accompanied by detailed work, work, uh, wood, woodcut, and it was compiled from older sources. There will be uh, like uh, Arabic, Arabic, medieval works, and, and then all these de description are in Latin text as well as German, okay? So, other than being the oldest uh, book in BHL, of course, there are. For, 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 for Peter Schofer, he, when he started that printing press, he produced uh, more of a like book, of, book, book of palms and things like that, you know, it's more bibliographic, I mean, more by, related to, to, to religion, to the Bible. Anyway, for him and his printing press is that when he first released, uh, when he first printed the book, he, he included bibliographic data, and that will be the one of them would be publication date. So he's the one who started it, all right? And if you want to know his today, his printing press, this printing house has become a brewery and he's uh, making beer. So you can go Google and you can find out about it. Now the last one is Richard Owen. Richard Owen, you know, if you're a dinosaur fan, you should know that he is the one who coined the term dinosaur or dinosauria. So it's like a uh, terrible reptile, okay? So he came out with this chart uh, and it's a book of extinction, uh, but it's paleontology, a systematic summary of extinct animals and their geographical relations. So for this title, this is a good chart. You, I mean, all these links down there, you can, you, you can go and uh, you can take a picture and you can go and explore, you can, you can Google it, just add a BHL and the title, you should be able to find it. What this chart shows is a different strata of the earth. And then uh, at the beside of the strata, he will insert all the different uh, us, species of dinosaurs that have uh, gone extinct. So we must know that when it came out in 1860, this is something that's very, very revolutionary. For us, we are very familiar with this kind, of, this kind of chart, but back then, it was something, okay? Okay, with that, we move on to BHL Singapore collection. So why is that? Okay, for this BHL Singapore collection, it actually contains items that has been contributed by us, the National Library, as well as uh, the Singapore Botanic Garden. So we are, we are partners and we upload our digitized uh, natural history uh, books onto BHL, yeah, and we call it the BHL Singapore Collection. But uh, okay, for us, we joined in 2014 and for, uh, for the Botanic Gardens, they joined in 2016, okay? And, but the website is maintained, I mean, the BHL Singapore Collection is maintained by us, so we do all the uploading. But we work, but we work very closely with them. All right, now, but before I go to show you just a few titles what we have in there, uh, it's good to show you some, some statistics, right? So roughly we have uh, 65,000 pages in there, so it comprise uh, over uh, 340 titles and 400 volumes. So it's pretty rich, yeah, pretty rich. Knowing that, you know, you must know that our history is not very long. Yeah, so it's pretty rich. Uh, in terms of visits, the collection has attracted uh, roughly about 15,000, over 15,000 visits since uh, 2014. So, uh, but currently it's uh, rough, uh, averaging about 650 visits per month, okay? 
So where do they come from? Again, all over the world, especially the top three, USA, Singapore, and UK. All right? And you get some visit visitors from India, Malaysia, Indonesia, our region and uh, countries. Okay, uh, there are some more statistics, just, uh, just to show you that, uh, well, it's pretty popular, you know, it's attracting like, what, 44,000 downloads? That's for our NLB light titles. For Singapore Protect Gunners, roughly about 22,000. But you must know that uh, Singapore Protect Gunners only join a bit later, they upload their stuff a bit later. But if you look at uh, the most recent data, with the smaller numbers, you can see that, uh, well, we are pretty close, okay? Both, that means both sets of titles are pretty popular, uh, pretty useful to users. Okay, so what can you do with it, right? Um, one thing is that uh, it will definitely help with anyone who's interested to do research on our natural history, okay? Like you can use it, okay, because uh, most of, a lot of studies from the botanic gardens, you can use it to, to find out the history of our botanic gardens. You can find out the history of our nature reserves. You can find out all sorts of things about our natural history. Okay, so this would definitely include uh, scientific names of animals and plants, illustrations, uh, observations of uh, these animals in their habitats, and things like that. All right. Of course, uh, we have few notes, diaries, and letters of uh, ex-directors uh, of the Botanic Gardens. And we have uh, and also uh, ethnographic and travel books. Okay? Those, if you want to use that, again, you can use it to get accounts of, uh, of different customs of the people back then and things like that. All right? And of course, uh, there are some titles that's related to our geography and climate. All right? So you want to trace, you can do now, let me go deeper into that. Like history of nature reserves is something that I like to do. All right. So to illustrate my point, we look at this. Okay. So if you want to do something on nature history, uh, na na nature reserves. Okay. Uh, you. These are some titles you can find find in Beisha, Starting with uh, 1883, that's a uh, Kenley's uh, Nathaniel Kenley's uh, forest report. So who is in Kenley? He was a uh, uh, former uh, superintendent. It was called superintendent back then of the Botanic Gardens. So what he did is that he came up with this report in 1883, uh, which was, by the way, if you want to find it, okay, our copy in the library, it's actually tucked in the pages of the 1883 Legislative Council. Okay, but for BHL, they took it out, okay, and they put it up there as a report itself. So if you want to find it you, through our NLB catalog, you will not be able to find it. Okay, so anyway, um, what this report does is that it highlighted the deforestation problem that the island was facing back then, and then introduced this island, uh, the idea of creating nature reserves. And the forest was commissioned by Governor Frederick Well, and was uh, well, it kind of changed, changed, uh, changed uh, the face of uh, Singapore because it established the first nature reserves. And then, uh, you want to trace further. You know, you can look at the annual reports of the Forest Department, a Forest Conservation Report, and Forest re and annual reports of the Forest Administration. You must know one thing that the Forest Department was after it was set up in 1884. What happened is that uh, it was under the Botanic Gardens before it was transferred. It was uh, actually closed. Then eventually it was took up by the Inland Revenue Department, which formed the Forest Administration Department. Yeah, if I'm not. Mistaken, let me check. Yes, for administration. Okay, anyway, from here, from all these annual reports, what you can see is that this uh, picture of how our, our, our reserves back then look like, okay, the conditions of it. Because uh, one thing is that they were not uh, covered with uh, large greenery, you know, like what you see today. Yeah. In fact, most of them, uh, and there are actually more than four, huh? okay, most of like 20 odds or something like that. They were actually uh, most covered with wastelands. I think Timothy Bernard, you wrote a lot on that. So, it's okay. So, so correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. I'm good? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so what, what, what it does is it says that, okay, most of them are wastelands. And then, uh, and then they actually launch a reforestation uh, movement. All right, that's also covered in all these reports. And like, that's why I have two boxes. The yellow boxes give you an idea of the size of each reserves, as well as the proportion that were, that were wastelands and all and, and proportion that was covered in primary forest. 
Then for the subsequent, uh, for the, for the for the next uh, box will be the uh, refor reforest uh, reforestation movement. Okay, so what they do is that they try to plant and they bring a lot of species from all over the world. So these are some species they have stated. So it will be a good start if you want to do a research on this and find something that uh, has not been written before. Okay, next uh, this is a map. Okay, this one is from, from the conservation report. I mean, com forest conservation report in. Uh, that was released in 1903. It's not the oldest map of the nature reserves. Uh. Okay, but what you can see is that what, is, what I'm trying to show is that we have more than four nature reserves. Okay, in fact, uh, we have more, like close to 20. You can see up there all the green, green spots. And then after that, we start to lose them to developments throughout the, you know, thanks, thanks to all this development. I'm talking about the British era, okay, until when until the post-independence period, then we left five. And then we lose the last one, which is today is what about Padan. That was in what, along the west coast. So that was the last one we lost. So now we have four. Okay. Something interesting. Then uh, another another topic you can do is the Pontine Gardens itself. Well, you know, a lot of people have already written about it, but you never know, you can find something different. Alright? Because why? Because they are Okay, other than the annual process, I, I think I have to cover it, okay? The annual process talks about, it traces the history of the Protein Gardens, it gives you an official view of it. And for VHL, it start, it had the oldest, poten, uh, oldest annual report you can find is 1866, but of course, the history of, of the Protein Gardens go back to 1854, uh, yeah, oh, sorry, 1859. So, and then uh, after that, it was under the Agri Horticulture Society until 1859 they will transfer the street settlements uh, government. Now, you can use this to, tr to trace all kinds of things, including something that has already been written before, which is, there was a zoo in, uh, in, in the Potter and Gardens in, 18, you know, in the 1870s. So I put up two pages up there. This is from the 1875 report, although they call, don't call it a report, okay? All right, but they call it the 1875 report of the Potter and Gardens. Okay, so what is, it talks about establishment of the zoo as well as the animals you can find in it. Okay, down here would be something that you may want to explore further, like, uh, no, actually it's also written by uh, a lot of people, including Timothy Bernard and the Botanic Gardens themselves, which is uh, uh, 1866, from, the, from, the, from, from this page you can find that, you can, you can learn that it was, uh, when it was uh, set up, back then it was a subscription Forest. I mean, it's garden. It's not a f public garden, so you have to pay to attend some of the events in there and things like that. But something that is that would be very very interesting would be the registers, okay? Which is this page over there. Something that's handwritten, right? So this one is uh, what it what what it shows is the seeds and plants acquired by the garden. So it has there in BHL you can find a lot of this, okay? There are many many years. Uh, roughly, what I'm showing here is from the 1950, from 1959, 1972, but there are but there are older older records in there. So what you can do with this, or anyone that is interested to do, <coughs> is to talk, is to look at the interaction between the product gardeners as well as the product gardeners around the world. Okay, you can see what plants have been have been have been put in that they have uh, imported, and what they have exported. Okay, that's outflow and inflow register. But one thing is that they are all handwritten, and no one has uh, has uh, transcribed it. Yep. So, but if you are crazy enough to go in there, go ahead, man. Okay. And then uh, also recently we have uploaded a few notes, diaries, and letters of the former directors of uh, Botanic Gardens and Botanists. All right. Uh, including oh yeah. So if you want to look at uh, some interaction between the directors as well as the administrator, colonial administrators, or things like that, you can go in and take a look. All right, next will be uh, the natural history of Singapore and the region. So what you can do is uh, use the Singapore collection to find things that related to this field. Okay, and uh, I sh there's a lot of titles, but I'll pull out some of them. Okay, this is just a handful of them, just a few of them. Okay, and what is showed, what I want to say that uh, in these books, it seems like uh, they're going to list, allow, list out all the animals and plants that are found in whatever places that these books are, 
uh, were written, but of course it's more than that because they contain scientific names, scientific observations of this species and things like that, research methodologies that are used by these authors to collect the information. Okay, so someone who's doing dissertation, things like that, I think we find this extremely useful. And of course, they all come with beautiful illustrations. You want to get them, uh, just go to the Flickr page. You can download them, okay? And uh, yeah, this one is from the birds of uh, Singapore Island. Down there is uh, illustrations from gleanings of natural history. Okay, this book. Okay, so gleanings of natural history. So the fourth title and the third title, A Natural History of Uncommon Birds. These two are the most popular uh, BHL downloads uh, for the Singapore collection. Okay, it was written, what, 1743, 1700s? So it's like, what is it going to do in Singapore, right? But in fact, it's nothing to do with us, okay? But one thing you have to know is that it's written by, uh, let, me, let me check, okay, Edwards, right? George Edwards. So who is he? George Edwards is a famous, famous, uh, I call it the, the father of British ontology. Ontology. Not a brother. There's not a hurt brother from the video. No, it's not a brother. Ornithology, okay? So I study birds. So why is it important? Because it contains engravings and descriptions of more than 600 species in natural history. Okay? This was some, when he published this, this, this book, okay, all these uh, volumes, it was unprecedented at the time. So no one had done such thing before. And because of that, he was, he was uh, actually appointed as fellow of the Royal Society and awarded a Copley Medal. But in the end, he sold his portfolio you know, to the Marquis of Butte and retired happily. Yeah. But one thing is that, uh, one thing I want to know, uh, one, one thing I'll share with you is like, if you look at the second row, that's the last, uh, last uh, drawings, that's the orangutan. So you must know that he did not travel all the way to the, to, to the Malay archipelago, to Borneo, to, to, to draw that orangutan, no, no. In, in fact, he explained that, okay, all these things he drawn through uh, co the collections uh, of, uh, of, uh, of no notable collectors or through specimens of the museum and things like that. Okay, so, we, so this is like one way of thinking about the research methodology that, that people used back then, okay? If you're interested, you look at such things. All right, this is the last slide. Okay. Uh, Another kind of book would be the ethnographic and travel books. Okay. I brand them together, but you, know, you may disagree with me, but I think that's the easiest to, to put them together because it kind of, uh, what, what it shows is uh, because, okay, because first of all, they're all written by travelers and anthropologists, ethnographers, colonial administrators, and whatnot. Okay. So they contain observations of custom and culture of the people. Okay. So they contain uh, all kinds of accounts the variety of accounts, oh, oh wait, other than cultures, they also uh, contain accounts of plants and animals, okay, that the author came across during, during his, or his or her travels, okay. Now, uh, I put out some title up there. Uh, the one on the top is the Malay Archipelago. Now there will be travels in the East Indian Archipelago. Now, this one is, uh, the one down there is written by uh, Albert Smith Bigmore. So he's a, he, was a, he, he, he was an American and then he came over here. And then he did his travels, and then he went back, and then he, one, this is like the founder who, of the American Natural History Museum, okay? So from these books, from these pages I've shown you, you can see that not only he just showed descriptions of plants, animals, and customs and stuff, he also includes statistics, data, okay? Export, import of, uh, of the Dutch East, East, East Indies. Okay, others which I, I did not show here is the Aboriginal Tribes okay, by Richard uh, James Wilkinson. Uh, he's a colonial administrator. So he's, so he's already uploaded up there. I, I stated the title up. Did I say that up top? Oh yes, the, the third title, 19, 1910. So he published as part of, the, part of a series of papers on Malay subjects written by him. Okay, so it's a, this, these subjects are in Malaya and it was used uh, as a government instruction to help, help uh, British cadets to understand the local culture in Malaya. And the uh, cadets also used the, uh, this title, which I've shown up there, for their entrance <coughs> exam to the Malayan Civil Service. Okay, if you're interested also, we have uh, James uh, Richardson uh, Logan's uh, ethnography books. So, 
yeah, there's a trade volume. One is, one is on the Indo-Pacific Islands, I think. And the other one will be on Asia. And one more is in the Pacific, is it? Oh, the Malay Archipelago. And uh, also, we uploaded a uh, Logos journal also up there. I think t only two, two volumes. We are, we are trying, trying to upload more. OK, with that, I'll just end on my, my, my presentation. So questions? This answer. Right? I mean, this question. Right? Okay, first thing is we have to ensure that this, those books that we uploaded, in fact, we uploaded for National Library 100 titles only. And that's because uh, we have cleared the copyrights. We know that it's copyright free. Yeah, almost everything is over 100 years old. That's the problem, right? Yeah, I, I did raise such things. I say, I say, how is it possible, right? How is it possible? It's 100, man. We, we have like uh, 25,000, I mean, 10,000 10, rare books up there. They're all over 100 years old. But I do not know. There's some question like, <laughs> there's something mysterious of life, right? But for Botanic Gardens, they are different because they own, the, own most of the titles. So they can just give us the clearance. And hence, they have a larger collection than us now. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, assuming that the Nature Society had discovered some um, unknown plants and animals in the areas being redeveloped, and if when they photographed it and posted on the face on our Facebook page online and other social media. Would it, would it have to do with our hidden gems of biodiversity? Okay. You see, currently, we, our partner, we are only one partner. That is the Botanic Gardens. So if the Nature Society has something, you have your own publication, you have your own data, your own uh, collections, owned by the Nature Society, and by all means, you can always approach us. We can try to work things out. But one thing is about is uploading for the uh, pictures, and that's something that is uh, that that the BHL uh, does not have any uh, function as I mean currently. Okay, they are they are working on it because uh, for botanic gardens they have artworks as well, and we have digitized them, but uh, we can't upload them because the system, uh, the back end system, cannot uh, can I mean, it, it can't work with it yet. Not yet at this moment. Okay. But Nature Society is interested, please do look for us. If you have something, because we are looking for new partners. All right. Thank you, Sensei. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question about <coughs> whether, you know, if someone else uploaded the same typo, would VHL sort of say somebody already uploaded something similar? You know, would it actually detect and reject your, you know, your 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 trying to upload? So, is there okay ways? Uh, to yeah, it is okay. Um, I'm trying to pull the browser here to show you an example. Your uh, slide. Okay, what I want to tell you is like this. Okay, say Botanic Gardens, they have Gardens Bulletin, all right. So this is one of the titles that they uploaded. Then in Harvard. Uh, Harvard Library, they also have Gardens Bulletin and they uploaded theirs. So will it conflict? No, it won't. So sure. what it shows is that for one title, it's just, uh, okay, you can find records of this title, I mean, you can find this title, right? But at the same time, you can also link to the similar uploads by other libraries of the same title. So it doesn't conflict. In fact, it complements it. You, you just put down there that you can go to the copy that has been uploaded by another library. So in terms of same books, like yeah, it, it is still all right. Yeah, it's still all right. So maybe a person have the edition of the first edition or second edition. It still all would be accepted. Yes. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, let me see if I can find a good example here. Like, see, over here is by Harvard. Oops. Then you can see the holding institutions is by Harvard. Then you also can find a similar one, but the holding institution is by Botanic Gardens. Yeah, so it kind of, uh, it, it won't reject, okay, it won't reject. Yeah. Oh yeah, one thing, uh, uh, one very useful stuff is they have this uh, bibliography records because they use, because you see, imagine everyone uploads uh, similar titles or, or the titles that came before it. They were able to capture it and then it tells you the history of the publication itself. Like Gardens Bulletin was not known as Gardens Bulletin. Back then it was known as many, many, many names. I think there are more than this. All right. Okay. Thank you.